Welcome to the Poetry Flash virtual reading series. I'm Joyce Jenkins, Poetry Flash editor and director at Poetry Flash in Berkeley. Today we are pleased, very pleased to present Barbara Hamby and Barbara Rass. Thanks to Mo's books in the chat box, there is a bookshop.org link to purchase the new books by these two excellent poets. Please check it out. It's very easy to order from bookshop.org and you'll be supporting independent bookstores. Bookshop.org slash lists, L-I-S-T-S slash poetry hyphen flash hyphen readings. To sign up for our event emails, go to poetryflash.org and scroll down to join our mailing list. Remember to visit poetryflash.org for book reviews, interviews, and literary events. Here to introduce our poets is Poetry Flash Associate Editor, Richard Silberg. Hi, uh, hi. Uh, I am, I'm always excited about these readings, but this, this is a real, this is going to be a really, really good one. We've got two rich, compelling books from Pittsburgh University Press. And uh, as Joyce told you, or, or if she didn't, I'm about to tell you that Barbara Hamby is going to read first. And her, I believe this is her eighth book. And uh, it's called Holo Holo, which she, we're told in the, all of these poems are called odes. And at the beginning of the Holo Holo odes, we're told that that word is a Hawaiian word for setting out without a, uh, a fixed destination. And these, the, these poems are astonishing really in a couple of ways, but first they are astonishing bursts of loquacity. <laughs> As you look at them, the, the, uh, the uh, basic look is long line, solid, maybe for a, a page and a half of the poet talking about a wild variety of subjects. And uh, so, so the, these are floods of words, but more important than that, they're compelling. They're compelling, they hold your interest. They're about all kinds of different things. What comes immediately to mind is the, the language. Uh, language is, is featured, a poem on slang, a poem on her uh, boyfriend's Yiddish, uh, a poem on onomatopoeia, which goes through about 15 different languages. So all of that is happening. And then key, most important, is that this is really beautiful poetry. Just almost at random, let me give you a quick example is a poem here, Ode on Girlfriends, the Brain, and Those Little Cookies You Dip in Wine, which the poem tells us are Cartucci. And here's just the end, just the end, just so you can get a feel of the sale, the, the poetic sale of this. There's a shop that has even better Cantucci. So life goes on, but every time I eat one of those cookies, dipping it in tea or wine, I think of the baker lying on his deathbed, his life of flour and water and pignoli fading the way daylight ebbs 
out of the sky before darkness comes with its sliver of moon and stars scattered like sugar in the heart of the night. How's that? How's that, boys and girls? So let's let's give her a, a warm, warm welcome, Barbara Hamby. Can everyone hear me? Great. Okay, good. It's so great to be in California, even virtually, thanks to the Berkeley Poetry Flash and Joyce for asking me to read. I'm very excited. This is um, a real thrill. Um, as Richard said, holo holo is the Hawaiian word for walking out with no destination in mind. And um, uh, when I decided to call the book this, I had no idea that going holo holo would be something so supernatural and filled with longing when the book was published. Uh, other languages have words for this. In French, there's the flaneur, a man who walks aimlessly around a city, probably Paris. A new book has been written about a, uh, by a flaneuse, a woman who walks around cities. And in Italian, there's the passeggiata, the aimless walk that people take after dinner. In Australia, it's the walkabout. In I Ireland, there's the gallivant. I grew up in Hawaii, so I'll stick with holo holo for my aimless walking around my consciousness and the world. Um, as Richard also mentioned, this is a book that's all odes, an ancient uh, poem of praise. A Sumerian priestess and poet, Enhe Duana, wrote one of the first odes praising uh, Inanna, the Sumerian goddess of love and war. Enhe Duana was also the first human to sign her name to uh, her writing, which never ceases to thrill me. A thousand years later, the Hebrew poets began to write their psalms praising their God, and 500 years after this, Greek odes were being written. The Roman poet Horace wrote in the first century BC, and of course the Romantic odes are some of the most beautiful, especially Keats' odes of 1819. In the 20th century, the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda turned the ode on its head with his elemental odes in the early 1950s. Instead of goddesses or nightingales, he wrote about tomatoes and his socks. And odes are still being written today. One of my favorites is Yusuf Kumanyaka's Ode to the Maggot, which shows how far the palm of praise has traveled from its beginnings in the ancient Sumeria. Holo Holo opens with Ode on Fire. I love to take a bath at night before bed, and when the water's ready, I light candles. Candlelight is very flattering to an older woman. One night, I was lighting candles while wearing a kimono with long sleeves, and for a moment, I was on fire. I thought, gosh, if I can't write a poem about this, I don't know myself very well. This was right after the election of 2016, a dismal time for uh, of really panic and fear. So it started with my kimono being on fire, but it went someplace else pretty quickly. Ode on Fire. I'm setting myself on fire with Jehovah, with Mohammed, with night bombing drones over Syria because the world is ending as it does every day with the sun burning a quicksilver blaze, its cities falling into a desert of hunger and thirst, and someone's lighting a match in the wind, storming across Siberia, Kansas, Venezuela, Qatar, and every heart as hard as quartz in its mansion of gristle and fat, while towns set themselves aflame with the wigwag lights of police cars, their howling blue, their pow, 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 and streets explode while Joy Ramon screams on the cosmic radio, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And the sky tumbles into its jinx of cerulean and copper, offers up its mystery to any punk traveling at the speed of light. Because this is our science, our sorcery, our Snapchat surveillance of time, that two-bit huckster on the corner of Bollywood and Rhyme, who says, pick a card, any card. And what do you know? It's night 
death and the devil because the plague is seizing in our mitochondria, in our guts, in our, on our tongues. And this is our word hoard, our dictionary of love and conflagration, our Bible of fallen walls and trumpets. So I am setting myself on fire with nickel bags of hooey, handing cigars to big daddies at the Tropicana while revolution sneaks into Havana with, with its guillotines, its bloodbath, its glorious technicolor color Fords and Chevys. So be afraid, comrades, because I am the cigarette girl with the bazooka of annihilation, the dim bulb heroine of this humdrum let them eat cake zero some hullabaloo. Yeah, baby, that stew of screw them all you can strum on the cosmic, uh, the karmic guitar. So I'm setting myself on fire with the dead-eyed plasma TVs in living rooms off I-10. The KKK Krispy Kreme diaspora shaking jowls from sea to shining sea. Oh, say can you see the sun coming up? A ball of fire or a fair hot wench in a flame-colored taffeta? It matters not, brothers and sisters, as we fly through the universe of black holes, a wash in the cast iron trembling of the stars. Um, that image at the end, a fair hot wench in a flame color taffeta, I stole from Shakespeare, just to let you know uh, that I'm stealing from the best in this book. Um, it's at the beginning of Henry IV, part one, and Prince Hal says this to Falstaff. It's just love that play. The pandemic uh, has put a damper on a lot of things, but it's been especially hard on parties. The last party I went to was last March 12th for a friend's birthday. Little did we know that March 12th would come around again with not a party in sight. I have a love-hate relationship with parties. As an introvert, I tend to drink a little too much so I can talk to people I don't know. Hell, even people I know. But I also love parties too, because especially dance parties. So I'm I'm also in love with words, and American English, for some reason, has a lot of words for parties. Ode on Words for Parties, American Edition. Why do we have so many words for parties? A slew of them once you start looking shindig, bash, meet and greets, raves, blowouts, barbecues, and more tepid functions, receptions, luncheons, and dues of all kinds. Though let's face it, most people don't have uh, most people have no clue about how to throw a party. Like the friend who was complaining because her husband wanted to have lots of food at the brunch they were planning, but she knew people didn't go to parties to eat. And Marcia and I had to break it to her that brunch was the combination of two meals, so her guests were expecting to eat double. And you can't believe the shock on her face. But her husband put out a great spread and everyone ate and talked. Though we've all been to those parties with the bowl of dead chips and the onion dip that looks like cat vomit on the driveway. Actually, not that good. But my sister throws a fabulous party because she's a great cook and has an army of wine bottles that never stops marching. And her garden is verdant. And she has a pool, which some people end up in, the in, end up in at the end of the night. What would be the word for that kind of party? Vino cool pool party? And the other one might be a kitty dip party. And guest, they can run a party too. Think of the music Nazis who make their way through the world with their one-upmanship. And your collection of Van Morrison and Jimi Hendrix is so uncool compared with the mud stumps and Echo Park, but only before they caved and became famous and were no longer cool. Then there are the couples who are glued at the hip like twins conjoined by church and state, or the bloviators or the drunks who can turn a party into a Godzilla stomps Tokyo apocalypse. Like the time the guy with a Ponderosa belt buckle slid chest first in a dance move and put a gouge three feet long in my hardwood floor. And I hadn't even invited him. He was my hairdresser's friend. That party was over. I wanted everyone out of my house. Or what about the people who live in the middle of nowhere? And you know that on the way home, you'll end up in Hades or in a ditch if you're lucky. What would you call those? Suburban hell parties? Hansel and Gretel lost weekend parties? 
I often try to talk my husband into pulling over so we don't crash, but he reminds me that we're just setting ourselves up for the serial killers who roam lonesome highways looking for poets. And what would you call that concatenation of events? Zodiac after party stab fest, post bash, head bash? You can see that when I'm not going to parties, I'm watching too many true crime shows, which make you mistrust your fellow humans beings in the most basic way. And yet we continue to throw parties, which is an interesting choice of verbs. And English is full of them. Throw a party, pitch a fit, pitch a tent, pitch a no hitter, pitch in, pitch black. And that's what the road is like now. And I give anything to be at that kitty dip party two blocks from my house with the Einstein brains blaring on the sound system so I can't hear the guy talking about how he prepares petri dishes for his research or the woman who's describing an airline ticket fiasco that wouldn't even be interesting if it had happened to me. But I guess that's life a continuum between darkness and malafoya, a Spanish phrase that describes an indifference so profound it can't be bothered with scorn. But I remember one of the best parties ever was a wine tasting put together by an Australian father and son. And by the end of the evening, everyone was dancing to Tutti Frutti and screaming drunk and in love with the world. And I danced with a roly poly law lawyer named Booter, who I never saw again. And the hangover the next day was a small price to pay for that crazy mix of Little Richard and Cabernet. And there was food. Yeah, but who remembers what? Holo Holo is dedicated to my husband, David Kirby, who is also a poet and who's made my life and poetry possible. He's also a dream travel companion. To go holo holo with David is so much fun. I can plan a trip, but he makes it an adventure because he's alive to the possibilities of every moment. But I'm also in love with a dead man, John Keats, whose ode started me on this project almost 30 years ago. I love his ode to a nightingale, which I've asked students to memorize for years and which I carry in my heart. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk. It's the most beautiful poem. One of my dreams was to hear a nightingale sing. We don't have nightingales in the Western hemisphere. I thought when I was in Greece that one of my beloved Greek poets would rustle up one for me, but no luck. Then one summer, David and I were living in Florence, lying in bed after a hard day of looking at frescoes and then eating spaghetti a la vongole, and a bird started singing in our courtyard. It was after midnight. It had to be a nightingale. David said, there's your nightingale. He's singing for you. Ode on my nightingale. My nightingale is the conquistador of moonlight, the engine of divine hullabaloo, the dance party of shining headlights on the dark road past midnight, the thrill of that first kiss in the battered chevette, the wrong turn that made me burn my map, clap twice, summon my gin. My nightingale is the stake in my heart that can't be dislodged, the hodgepodge of my brain at 2 a.m. when the drunks have gone home or passed out in the street. My nightingale trill, trills in the darkness, thinks of nothing but his song, says forget me at your peril, for I am the tiara of rain that falls from the purple sky, the lies you tell yourself to wake up from your dreams. So listen, because my song will fade into nothing, but nothing is made without me. I am the cosmologist of the atomic, high priest of everything you never wanted to be, all your hijacked dreams, the screams in the muddle of night, the beam of starlight on the river of sleep, for we are alone, my darling, on this planet of night, and I am your little god, your drinking water straight from the stream, for my song is spooling into the night forever and ever. Amen. I am the derivative of sin. Oh, let me in.
ode on my nightingale and the next poem I'm going to read are from the second section of Hola Hola, which is called ontological odes, which is a fancy way of saying odes that are trying to figure out what we're doing here on earth. Because I'm a woman, my focus tends to be on that category of being. And one of the things I find mystifying is how I ended up where I am. I didn't have a career plan. No one whose two favorite subjects in school were poetry and Renaissance art history could be said to be planning for the future. And yet here I am immersed in poetry and art. And because my university, Florida State University, has a study program in Florence, I've seen a lot of gorgeous Renaissance paintings over the years. Uh, in this poem, I'm trying to figure out how it happened. Ode to my younger self. You were beautiful and stupid, though you thought you were so smart. But in a way you were, because you love poetry and Beethoven and apples, but why did it take you so long to learn to drink coffee and eat breakfast? And those boyfriends, oh well, you were young and experimenting with everything, drugs, love, dancing at lesbian bars, meditating for a month at a Buddhist retreat, taking the train from Kansas City to New York and staying with a friend whose Buddhist master told her that you had bad vibes not to stay in the same apartment with you the same guy who gave her a special stone to put in her vagina to cure the bad vibes there. Though she wasn't the weirdest friend you had because that would have to be Marianne, who when I see her around town now and she's skinny, I know she's not taking her meds and that tiger stalk of hers will end up badly for me in the jungle of her mind. So I try not to make eye contact because more than anything, I don't want to put my combats on boot I do not want to put on my combat boots and wade into her psychodrama. And when I see young women walking down the street with that lost look in their eyes, I want to say to them, don't despair, beautiful young women. You'll find yourself and one day you'll wake up and realize you were always that person. But maybe I'm wrong because some women marry a guy who looks like a prince and end up in the morgue or refuge house or hanging themselves from the chandelier in their rented rooms. Time can be dangerous. So read Middlemarch, young women, because George Eliot can do your thinking for you until you get your own mind organized. Or Dostoevsky and Charlotte Bronte, who helped me navigate the utter stupidity of my early 20s. And Keats and Garcia Lorca. So in a sense, my younger self, you chose your friends well, though they were all in books. And Thomas Hardy, was one of your best boyfriends ever, wasn't he? Because you spotted Gabriel Oak across the room and were not pulled in by Sergeant Frank Troy. And Jane Austen, she taught you how to hold out for what you really wanted. And Virginia Woolf, she showed you how to be a woman and a man in the same body through time. And the Song of Solomon told you that love could be poetry so thank you for staying up all night reading and not going out to bars. And I really appreciate that dance class you took three days a week, all through your 30s. And after that, the yoga. I'm feeling fit right now, and I know I have you to thank. In those 11 years as a vegetarian, you really took care of my heart. Um, I was raised Protestant, so when I started taking art history classes in college, I was fascinated by the saints. Baptists don't have much to say about the saints, and they're not too hot on the Virgin Mary either. I married a man who was raised Catholic, so he helped me, but one thing I've never understood was the sacred heart, you know, the one that's on fire on Jesus's chest. What's that about? This next poem starts there, but ends up somewhere that was surprising to me. I should add that I fell in love with the female martyrs who are, uh, were portrayed by Renaissance artists with attributes of their martyrdom. St. Agnes, who's a big part of this poem, uh, had her breast, uh, breast cut off, ouch, and it is usually pictured holding them on a platter in front of her. So. This is Ode to the Sacred Heart of Everyone, including you and you and you. Oh, 
I spilled my water. Uh, hey, Catholics, what, did it, what is it with that red heart out there beating on Jesus's chest like some Frankenstein experiment gone bad? Mary too, and them acting like everything's so okay. When it's so not, as if being crucified weren't bad enough, not to mention the crown of thorns, but that horror movie heart surrounded by fire. Well, I know you're trying to say something, but what? It's like wearing your heart on your sleeve, but an extreme sport 100 mile run from Miami to Key West version. Like when you're 20 and have given your heart to a moron and you expect him to be Einstein. Well, not him, but a little smarter than the average. And he is not. As Celia says to Orlando Mad Roslind in As You Like It, it's as easy to count atomies as to resolve the propositions of a lover. And Jesus, your lovers have got to be one of the wildest bunch ever from St. Augustine to Jerry Falwell and the women too. St. Agatha being number one on my hit parade and her ersatz boyfriend, Quintianus, with uh, the Roman council who was not happy with Agatha's cold shoulder. So he sent her to a brothel for a month and cut off her breast. But St. Peter came and healed her wounds, though that didn't stop Quintianus, who threw her naked on burning coals. But she was saved by an earthquake, still praying to God to end her torture. And Renaissance painters love to show those detached boobs, just as they love to show St. Lucy holding her eyes on a plate, St. Catherine with the wheel that pulled her apart. Well, you get the picture. So I guess the hearts pumping away on Jesus's and, Mar Jesus's and Mary's chest are a part of the same package. But wait, I just saw Mary with a crown and six or seven swords piercing her bosom. And that's got to hurt, plus all the mess. But I'm getting off subject here, which happens a little too often for my taste. But what can you do, especially when the world is so wacky and religion is très bizarre, as the French have it? And Agatha died in peace. But Quintianus, who knows? He probably bought a farm and grew grapes and thought he was a pretty good guy. But he deserved to have half a dozen swords sticking out of his chest, as opposed to Mary, who was... Um, was minding her own business when God did what? That's a question no, no one seems to be able to answer, especially Jesus, since he was less than a baby at the time. And don't you think we should all be wearing our hearts pinned to our jackets? Not the real ones, but beautiful replicas, like the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz, because we all have a heart. Though some people make you wonder with their guns and border walls. So think about your sacred hearts, all of you. I was going to say dumbasses, but that's not really appropriate language for a poem, especially one that's skirting around the borders of religion. Though I'm with Chekhov, who said, my holy of holies is the human body and freedom from violence and lies, which sounds pretty beautiful to me. But like Chekhov's characters, we lie to ourselves every second we're alive. As when scarfing a piece of cake, I say, I have a sweet tooth but that cake's going directly to my ass. So a little closer to the truth would be, I have a sweet ass, which my husband has said on occasion, but who knows what the truth is. And since the asses are piling up here, I might as well call in the most famous ass of all, Bottom the Joiner, who was translated by a drop of fairy nectar. And that's what I need right now, or a micro dot of acid, but who knows where that might lead? Oh, hell, who knows where it all leads, but I love a trip. So let's catch the train to nowhere and see where we end up. And that's where we've ended up. Thank you so much for coming out or staying in. And let's hope that we can soon return to our lives of travel and parties and walking out into this beautiful, terrible world. Thank you, thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, one thing I forgot to say, which is evident from the reading is she is an, an erudite woman. And when you, when you get this book and read it, you're gonna learn a lot about art history and much, much else. All right, now our next reader from another beautiful book is Barbara Rass. Uh, from the Blues of Heaven, which is the name of the book, which I believe is her fourth book. Uh, 
And she is also just just to just to mention it. She's the founder emerita of uh, Trinity University Press, which was a fine, which is a fine press, and became so under her directorship. So the blues of heaven uh, has. Why don't we just start with with the blues of heaven, where that comes from? There's a poem. On I'm I'm flipping to to get to get to that poem. The poem is called Potatoes, and let me give you the beginning and the end, which will both tell you where the blues of heaven comes from and give you a sense of the, uh, the poetry of this book. Here's the beginning of Potatoes. More colors in the world than you and I can see. Take mantis shrimp, their vision capable of four times the primary colors given to us, we with souls. However, if you lie face down long enough in the ocean where it drops off into a dark made by water deprived of sun, the fish I call the blues of heaven will arrive, not in a school, but as a tree made of the blues of heaven. And that poem ends we're talking about potatoes and vodka here. It was rumored, say for a time when every last spud was gone, save for when all else failed, save to feed Stalin's horses, animals with the largest of all eyes, incapable of seeing red. So this is a book it's a poetry that has a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of cavils. I mean, much more important than cavils about uh, environment, about the destruction of wildlife, about her, uh, her parents and where she grew up, which was her parents were Polish immigrants and she talks about uh, essentially how shut down they were to anyone who wasn't speaking Polish. Now the book is dedicated to her, her brother Mike who died too early at about 50. And uh, she and Mike wanted pets that were not part of their, their parents' uh, idea of, of money and spending. But this is a book that is buoyed by its, again and again, by beautiful strokes of poetry. Let me just give you, I mean, this is almost at random, but uh, it's another another example of the poetry in this book. Uh, it's called The Day in the Park, and she spent the day uh, feeding pigeons and other animals with bread. And she ends, but already it's dusk, and the bell ringing has begun. The custodian who locks the park, walks the paths in a black dress, black hose, ringing us away. Though I have not yet spent all my stale bread or finished confessing my sins to the pigeons and the squirrels who listen and look. They look back at my whispers with one eye always one eye, as is the habit of priests bored in their dark boxes. 
uh, which I think is a beautiful, striking image and also uh, probably a remembrance of her uh, Catholic Polish uh, upbringing. So let's, let's give her a warm welcome, Barbara Rass. Are you there, Barbara? We can't hear you, Barbara. I'm unmuted. I'm going to start again, <laughs> taking a page out of Joyce's book. <laughs> so thank you to Joyce and Richard, and it's so great to be with you in Berkeley, even virtually. And I want to thank all the folks at Poetry Flash for the valiant work they do and for hosting me here again. And I want to say what a pure pleasure it is to read with Barbara Hamby, a great poet and dear friend whose reading was just spectacular in its range of, yes, erudition and also fabulous humor. So I salute you, Barbara. I want to begin by reading a poem by Adam Zagajewski, the Polish poet and one of the giants of world literature who died a week ago on Sunday, March 21st. He was 75. To honor Zagajewski's immense contribution to writing in both poetry and prose, here's an early poem of his from Tremor, his first collection to appear in English, published in 1985. And this translation is by Renata Gorczynski. The title is Late Beethoven. And there's an epigraph from Confucius that says, I haven't yet known a man who loved virtue as strongly as one loves beauty. Late Beethoven. Nobody knows who she was, the immortal beloved. Apart from that, everything is clear. Feathery notes rest peacefully on the threads of the staff like Martin's just come from the Atlantic. What would I have to be in order to speak about him? He who's still growing. Now we are walking alone without ghosts or banners. Long live chaos, say our solitary mouths. We know that he dressed carelessly, that he was given to fits of avarice, that he wasn't always fair to his friends. Friends are a hundred years late with their impeccable smiles. Who was the immortal beloved? Certainly, he loved virtue more than beauty, but a nameless God of beauty dwelled in him and compelled his obedience. He improvised for hours. A few minutes of each improvisation were noted down. These minutes belong neither to the 19th nor to the 20th century, as if hydrochloric acid burned a window in velvet thus opening a passage to even smoother velvet, thin as a spider web. Now they name ships and perfumes after him. They don't know who the immortal beloved was. Otherwise, new cities and pates would bear her name, but it's useless. Only velvet growing under velvet, like a hidden leaf, growing in another leaf, light in darkness, unending adagios. That's how tired freedom breathes. Biographers argue only over details, why he tormented his nephew Carl so much, 
why he walked so fast, why he didn't go to London. Apart from that, everything is clear. We don't know what music is, who speaks in it, to whom it is addressed. So obstinately silent. Why it circles and returns instead of giving a straight answer as the gospel demands. Prophecies were not fulfilled. The Chinese didn't reach the Rhine. Once more, it turned out that the real world doesn't exist to the immense relief of antiquaries. The secret was hidden somewhere else, not in soldiers' knapsacks. Grillpazer, he, Chopin. Generals are cast in lead and tinsel to give hell's flame a moment of respite after kilowatts of straw. Unending adagios, but first and foremost joy, wild joy of shape, the laughing sister of death. I really have to catch my breath. I think we have lost someone who is an immense talent and um, I confess someone who was very dear to me. I'll turn now to um, some poems from my new book, The Blues of Heaven. And this is the cover. Um, it's interestingly not a, an image of heaven. I hope you can see it. Um, it's an image of a horse underwater. And I purposefully chose that to ground the book against a title that is somewhat um, ethereal. I want to note that this book is um, haunted by death. Notably, the death, as Richard said, of my only sibling, my brother Mike, to whom the book is dedicated. The first poem I'll read is called Survival Strategies, and um, it refers to a number of elements that were part of my childhood. I grew up on the coast of Massachusetts on Buzzards Bay in a town that was famous for killing whales, New Bedford, Massachusetts. And the house that I lived in as a child from my early, my early girlhood to when I left at age 18 um, had a widow's walk. And it was a place that I haunted quite a lot in what was an isolated and sometimes lonely girlhood. This poem is called Survival Strategies. To dig for cohogs, to feel their edges like smiles and pull against their suck to toss them in a bucket. To feel the wind as a friend, to feel its current as luck, to ignore Capricorn and Cancer presuming to slice the globe, to know the lie in names can never hurt you, to be a gull breezing the blue, eating nothing but clouds, to measure your ties to the past by the strength of cobwebs, to haunt the widow's walk, its 12 narrow windows, each the size of a child's coffin, to watch the harbor where the Akushnet runs into Buzzards Bay before it was named a super sun, a super fund site full of PCBs. To wonder if that water you swam summer after aimless summer could get you the way something got your brother too fast, too soon. To bury or burn the whole family you were born to and talk to them only in the smoke of letters you torch at their graves. To see a snake with a ladybug on its back and still refuse to pray.
Many of these poems take a political turn, like many of my poems and like Barbara's, um, they start off in one place and end up at the end in an unexpected place because I think poetry does have a way of walking um, on its own path and with a mind of its own. This poem is called Flags. For some reason, we chose an island off Italy to bring a typewriter for repair. And meanwhile, Chianti and lounging on the balcony, pondering if Kafka had in fact invented the hard hat. And who came up with the idea of hotel maids folding toilet paper into triangles, pointless points. Imagine the cumulative moments the world bloody wide spent thus, instead of indulging in a decent foot soak, thinking perhaps about a grandmother in the village, her mother's mother, who greets her by taking her hands and rubbing them long enough to wring out hundreds of secrets. Never forget the names of our breads, she will say, and together they'll sit staring at the horizon. One thing we have in common, seeing as we too are looking out at it now, the horizon holding up the entire sky all day, pulling down the sun, that golden child reluctant to go to bed. And when there is wind sending rolls of whipped cream to our shores, but forget flags. The horizon refuses flags. None of that vain flappery, whether the saltier of Scotland, the eagles of Albania, the wounded sheet of Latvia, flags flown in theaters, colonies, operations, flags carried in the children's crusade, rags, no doubt, flags for genocide after genocide after genocide, we find it humanly possible to abide. The day a crucial button fell off my blouse into the toilet was the day Trudy, my nine pound terrier mutt, put her paw on my bare foot like a scrap of crushed velvet and though I wanted to send thoughts of gratitude into, into her little dog brain, all I could do was envy her for not having to wear clothes or get her mental panties in a wad trying to figure out what the Nepali poet meant by Westerners love Rilke because he approaches the preliterate. It was the day I learned that Dell has a detector under their computer keyboards to re record fist bangs and thus dodge warranties. Imagine pummeling a machine as if it could fix the brokenness of parents who dismay about their own choices could be passed down to their kids through the knives set at the table. It was the day I learned the CIA plans to geoengineer the stratosphere by spraying toxic coal fly ash to offset global warming. And this, on a day I learned residents in Karachi are digging mass graves to prepare for another heat wave like last year's that killed 1,300 people increasingly days like this end will who will end with who the hell will pickaxe a trench for me in 127 degrees. The next poem called, <clears throat> excuse me, called The Money Coat is actually a combination of 
um, dream and imagination and history. And it, it's really a, a conglomeration of things that at some point, I couldn't tell where one began and the other left off, but I think the poem will probably reveal that to you. The Money Coat. In a strange succession, cousins I didn't know I had started popping into my life. One sending a photo of my father's family and of the three generations huddled in the parlor. Nobody, but nobody left but me and the ache of unanswered questions. After the cousins disappeared, I met Pavel, the one who didn't make it to the States and lived as a bachelor in Warsaw, supporting his parents who had survived the war by eating, excuse me, who had survived the war hiding in holes in the rubble, Germans attacking from the right, Stalin laughing from the left. I confess I'm trying out a new technology and that is probably um, creating a little bit of um, disturbance. So I'm going to begin with Pavel, the one who didn't make it to the States and lived as a bachelor in Warsaw, supporting his parents who had survived the war, hiding in holes in the rubble, Germans attacking from the right, Stalin laughing from the left. Chances are Pavel was a figment, but he told me he thought eating rats paralyzed his parents, making them unfit for reality. Pavel, I said, nobody is fit for reality, but he scoffed, calling me a fool who had never stood in line for bread, which led to an argument about hunger and then agreement about the failure of communism and capitalism, which is why he was headed to the casino to bet it all, his life savings with dumb bravado. Then we lost touch. I imagine him winning big, going home to sew his lotes into a coat a sable coat he bought from the Russian scum at the Kroll Bazaar, haggling for more than an hour, maybe two, reaching a razor sharp price. He'll probably sew the money into the lining of his coat, not for security, but in memory of the coats who escaped, the ones who didn't. My dear Pavel, when you board a ship at the Vistula docks, I hope the river will wash you of some memories and a lot of pain. Please don't act like a maniac throwing caviar, Russian caviar to the seagulls. Don't drink a daily bottle of vodka, the stylish one named for the small ponies in the ancient forests of your country. Let the weight of your sable coat anchor you. And when you reach the open ocean, please, let the churning of sea foam calm you and stand at the rail of the ship, the wind animating the fur of your coat and look into the distance until you can't tell the sting of salt water from the sting of tears. Next, I'm going to read a poem that your cardiologist will never endorse. I happen to believe that eating a nice meal before bed is something that will bring on a great sleep because all the energy in your body is going down from your brain, which is working overtime as soon as you hit the pillow and hopefully down there in your gut getting the food digested and letting you sleep the best sleep. So this is called recipe for sleep. Fill 
your belly with pasta mixed with arugula, olives, cherry tomatoes, garlic equal to two months worth of Ambien and a healthy dose of olive oil infused with Meyer lemon that grew in your Berkeley yard, another loss you long to forget. In bed, try to ignore the fire ants building a nest in the petty parts of your brain. Lingering garlic won't help to banish them or the ghoulish replays of parties where you felt like a goat in a tree or release you from tomorrow's junk box of the many people you'll disappoint. Remember the composer whose success came after taking her teacher's advice to look in the mirror 10 times a day and repeat, I can do it. If you get up to go to the bathroom and turn on the tap, don't think about the water on demand rushing from its own sleepless place. Don't think about the South African women collectively walking the distance of 16 times. Don't think about the South African women collectively walking the distance of 16 times to the moon and back daily to carry water. If I can do it, doesn't do it, think about the luck of your life. Recite in alphabetical order the names of your friends or in a random list, name all the people who've hurt you, make up ways to forgive them. And as for that can of worms you carry around, even to bed, at least be glad you've been spared thus far from opening it. This is a poem that begins with music, but ends in gunfire. And I want to read this in recognition of the recent slaughters in Atlanta and in a place not far from where I am now, Boulder, Colorado. Take a chance. From the drummer, take the cymbals, the crash and hi-hat, and walk like you're shining. From the composer, take water under snow is weary, sung by young voices in the timber of wind blowing through deer antlers. From the organ maker, take the names of the stops, night horn, box celeste, and chimney flute, whose reverberations could theoretically go on forever. From the gypsy, take any castanets offered and play them first thing, first thing to get you out of bed, despite the news of nine dead in Charleston, who invited a white kid into their prayers at the Emmanuel AME Church where he repeatedly shot the gun whose one note is death. Take a chance, take guns away and ask people to hum more, to whistle if unlike me, they know how, to talk often like baby turtles who start vocalizing inside their eggs. Every ri river's original name was water weeping water laughing. Take the call of a cricket or a ricochet of crickets, each with its own thumbprint. Take the cry of a bush baby at night that narrows down to nothing, the distance between it and us. Both are wailings scored by loneliness, shocking the night air, calling for kin calling for help to perpetuate the species. Take a lesson from the bush baby with its exotically large eyes that see what we don't see, its paws and mouth that eat whatever they kill. Uh, 
I'm going to close with um, a poem called Salad Days. And many of us associate Salad Days with contemporary youthful innocence, but I want to mention that it first appeared in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. And for that reason, Shakespeare is referred to in the poem. Salad Days, how easy then the fun house at Lincoln Park, before it grew into a field of weeds, you could buy five tickets for a buck from a blank face in a booth and enter the dark with your brother to be scared by tilting floors, phony doors, corpses bursting out of coffins, and once out into blue sky, run breathless to your mother and father, happy. You could have called them salad days, but why would you? No one in your family had read Shakespeare. So you bought French fries, doused them with malt vinegar, the four of you competing for your share of potatoes improved by salt and grease. And nothing in those early evenings free of care could have prepared you to be the last one left, the one with grief to spare. Thank you. All right, all right. Let me let me thank these two terrific Barbaras, Barbara Hamby, Barbara Rass. Thank you, thank you. Here comes Joyce to sign us off. To echo what uh, Richard just said, um, thanks to these two wonderful, wonderful poets. And please take a look at their um, new books from University of Pittsburgh Press. They're gorgeous books. The link is in the chat box. It's uh, courtesy of Moe's Books in Berkeley. You'll be helping independent bookstores and you'll find it will go very easily. Bookshop dot, what is it? Book, what is it? Uh, bookshop dot org slash lists, L I S T S slash poetry slash uh, hyphen flash hyphen readings. And uh, thanks to Rosalinda, our tech support. And thanks to each and every one of you for joining us. Please check out poetryflash.org for more in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. And um,